Hello and welcome to today's webinar on how to leverage cloud and big data to beat churn. My name is Jeremy Cowan. I'm Editorial Director and Founder of Vanilla Plus, and it's my pleasure to be your moderator today. Thank you for joining us. We've got a great discussion for you, brought to you in association with Plume and backed by independent analysis from Beecham Research. We're also delighted to welcome White Fiber, who can answer questions on the benefits of choosing, as they did, the Plume Churn Management Solution. In this webinar, we're going to explore how you can build an effective strategy to tackle and beat subscriber churn. And uh, doing so, starting with rock solid, smart, whole home Wi-Fi. So the first thing uh, that I want to do is introduce you to our speakers. They are Robin Duke Woolley, who is Chief Analyst and Founder of Beecham Research, and he will be speaking first. It's good to have you back, Robin. Great to see you, Jeremy. It's also my absolute pleasure to welcome Tyson Marion, Chief Commercial Officer at Plume. Great to have you here too, Tyson. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. And we're delighted to be joined today by John Irvine, CEO of a leading UK internet service provider, White Fiber. Welcome to you too, John. Good afternoon. Now, many of you will be familiar with the way this works. So you'll know that this webinar is being recorded and you can access it in the next 24 hours via vanillaplus.com. Before we start, let me just say, we really want to know what you think. So start sending us your questions right now. Then after the presentations are done, I will put your questions and some of my own to our VIP panel. All you have to do is click on the questions button and type your query into the window and I'll put as many uh, questions as I can to our speakers in the time available. Plume slides will be made available after the webinar. And finally, if you're having any technical issues with audio or slides, you can also use the question window to get advice from our great technical support team. So without further ado, I'd like to um, hand over to Robin Duke Woolley to talk us through uh, the overview of this. Robin, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Jeremy. So um, I'm just going to do a, a fairly brief uh, introduction to the, uh, to the overall uh, smart home market uh, as uh, an introduction to what uh, Plume uh, is then going to talk about. So we're talking here about uh, the, uh, the smart home market and uh, we're talking about um, uh, can the number of connected devices uh, it, it, for per, per person has been increasing um, over the last few years, uh, but it, it, it's going to accelerate uh, over the next uh, few years. So, you know, when, when, when you're in your home, um, there's, there's, there's the phone, of course, um, and uh, in, increasingly the, uh, the cell phone uh, it, it, or smartphone uh, connected to uh, the, uh, the home network and then tablets and then wearables, uh, now connected TVs, and then to uh, lighting and, uh, and CCTV. So we're beginning to get some uh, real numbers of, uh, of devices uh, in, in the uh, home market uh, now. And uh, here is a, a comparison of um, uh, just where things have been uh, moving. Now this excludes um, uh, smartphones and tablets, it's uh, other devices in, smart, in the smart home. So, um, we, we saw in, in 2019 that uh, there was a focus on uh, smart TVs being connected, and that's now shifting more towards uh, the smart lighting systems. Smart speakers, of course, uh, are very popular uh, still. Uh, they have been and they continue to be. So uh, there is a move towards uh, newer devices, uh, and uh, you know, there's an, a lot of smart TVs already out there. Um, and overall, we're looking at a, a growth rate of about uh, 21%, uh, according to this, uh, this source, CounterPoint, uh, which is a three times growth in uh, the period uh, 2019 to 2025. Um, and then uh, moving on to uh, what that means from a Wi-Fi perspective, about 
75%. We're heading towards about 75% of the of those devices being connected by uh, by Wi-Fi uh, by by 2025. So it's becoming much more dominant. And uh, and by 2023, um, most of those are going to be uh, Wi-Fi six uh, that uh, becomes becomes dominant. So we're starting to see a a, a, a substantial growth. Um, there's going to be uh, six billion uh, new connected devices uh, over the next uh, few years uh, in the marketplace, and that uh, leads to a whole new set of potential challenges uh, for um, uh, s uh, connectivity or communication uh, service providers. So um, this slide is 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 uh, divided into uh, three segments really. First of all, uh, Wi-Fi six in smart homes. Um, it's going to support speeds around 30% faster than uh, Wi-Fi 5, uh, with a maximum transfer speed of about uh, 10 gigabit, gigabits per second. Uh, and even in uh, traditional 2.4 gigahertz networks uh, or traditional bands, um, they'll experience uh, increased speeds when using uh, Wi-Fi 6 uh, routers. Looking at the market, um, there's home. There's a lot more home working now, and running small businesses from uh, from home is becoming a, a growing trend, um, and that's been accelerated very much by the uh, by the pandemic. Um, we're all getting very used to um, video calls, uh, video conferencing, and of course the uh, the bandwidth that goes with that, uh, and that of course all needs to be managed. Um, and then you know, these together with uh, much more uh, smart home devices uh, indicate, um, I think, customer expectations of smart homes uh, are changing. So what, what, what used to be done a few years ago uh, is, is changing, and I think uh, expectations are changing uh, in, in the marketplace, and the pandemic has uh, accelerated that. Um, and there is a need to find uh, new ways to use uh, networking and mobile services, um, much more use of uh, smart home two devices to access voice, video, uh, and data services. And these represent uh, new opportunities for uh, connectivity um, service providers, communication service providers, as well as challenges to uh, regular services uh, offered. Uh, CSPs need to be able to deliver uh, a comprehensive uh, portfolio of leading edge uh, smart services at scale and continue adding uh, the latest services as new services become available. So they, they need to employ uh, new business models uh, that reflect uh, changes in, uh, in customer expectations. And that means that there are a number of challenges for, uh, for CSPs uh, as part of that. Um, yeah, legacy solutions um, are constrained by designs that are essentially hardware centric and based on uh, old to older technologies. So what do you do about that? Um, that leads to recurring issues of uh, lack of speed and the uh, agility needed to support uh, business level initiatives. And it holds back a uh, generic uh, transition to uh, cloud centric solutions. Um, and we see uh, some significant challenges uh, as a result of that uh, for CSPs. Um, first of all, a significant backlogs of services and products. Um, CSP, CSP uh, product deliveries are, are, are complex with uh, many moving parts. There's uh, IT ordering systems, uh, activation, uh, marketing, pricing tariffs, uh, support training, and so forth. And all of those are implicated or, or affected by, uh, by changes. Um, there's a, 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 the percent of, uh, of single play uh, customers uh, is rising, uh, and that's leading to uh, higher churn. And that's going to be uh, the main subject of discussion uh, in the next set of slides from, uh, from uh, Tyson. Um, there's operational expenses to support uh, customers uh, are increasing rapidly uh, for connectivity services. Uh, and the support options are limited uh, for those uh, at the moment. And then systems um, used for provisioning, uh, service activations, monitoring, uh, and lifecycle uh, management become difficult to update uh, with uh, existing technologies. So these are all challenges that are becoming uh, more into play um, as, as we move forward with um, 
uh, new smart home requirements and, uh, and, the, and the changes that uh, people are looking for. So now I'm going to hand over to uh, Tyson, who's going to uh, uh, give us a, a, a real insight as to uh, how Plume is responding to these challenges on, on behalf of um, uh, CSPs. Over to you, Tyson. Great. Thank, thank you, Robin. Um, thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Um, so I'm Tyson Marion, the Chief Commercial Officer of Plume. Uh, I've been in a lot of your shoes. If you're operators, I've been there. Uh, I was an operator for a, a long time. Um, and a lot of my colleagues were also operators. Uh, it's one of the reasons why uh, Plume was founded and why it does what it does is we were seeing a lot of the challenges that Robin uh, had mentioned and we, we saw how things were progressing and wanted to ensure that we could provide a solution that would almost future-proof what we all knew was coming, some of which accel was accelerated by the pandemic, but some of the things that uh, nobody really knows about. Um, if you think about 10 years ago, nobody even, a, a Peloton bike wasn't even a thing. Uh, now you can't order one without having to wait eight months to get it. So, you know, being on the operating side was really uh, important in the genesis of Plume and, and where we've come to this point. Um, so churn is the biggest cost to our business. And I'm going to use ours because as a, as a term because we believe at Plume that we are part of solving that problem. And we believe that we do that with our partners hand in hand. So that churn is really truly the biggest cost to our business. Um, and if you think about where we've been, we've been very happy as an industry with this bundle that we've served our customers. And that bundle really that sort of bread and butter was voice, video, and data. And what we've seen has, you know, recently, uh, more recently, is that there's been a significant decline in that bundle and a breaking of that bundle. And it's really not necessarily due to people's lack of interest in paying for services. It's the difference in my mind is that we as a society have changed the way that we not only communicate, but as a society, we've changed our sense of urgency. We are now an on-demand economy from how we order groceries to how we communicate with our families. If you think about voice, the fixed line isn't declining because people don't want to pay that money. The fixed line is declining because that's not how we communicate. We communicate through Slack or text or these sorts of messages. And that's put a significant strain in, in, in a reduction in people who do take fixed line voice. From a video perspective, it's the same thing. People want the content they want to see when they want it. They want on-demand services. And a lot of the folks in this, you know, in the industry and outside of the industry, namely big tech, realized that, uh, realized this dynamic, this on-demand dynamic, and really started to offer more video options. Both voice and video, if you think about it, voice, the on-demand uh, nature of voice and how we communicate today, and the on-demand nature of video and how we consume that today, all has been delivered by the cloud. And cloud has probably been the biggest change, technological change, in being able to keep up with these customer expectations. But still, all of that has to be delivered over the internet. And so that's the beacon of hope um, that we're all looking to, to really uh, continue to build our businesses. And our concern is that there is this accelerating shift to single play. Now that people have different options for voice or video, what we've seen in all of our mixes, if we look at our total portfolio of single, double, and triple play services, really starting at the end of uh, 2019, we saw a change in that mix. And that single play became the predominant product uh, of choice by our customers. The concern there is that in the bundles, we love those bundles really for one big reason. And that's because the more products and services a customer had, the less likely that customer is to churn. It wasn't because it generated a ton of revenue. We saw that uh, with things like increasing programming costs, margins compressed in the video product. So it's not about the revenue in, in that sort of thing. It's about the churn. And the churn in our industry cost, what we've done at Plume is sort of calculated, what, what is that cost of churn uh, in our industry? And we believe it's around $1,600. And the way that we get there is we take a look at, um, we take a look at what the long-term, uh, or excuse me, the lifetime value of a customer is. 
And what Plume has, has, has found across its 24 million homes is that when Plume is inside those homes, we have an ability uh, with our service provider partners to extend the lifetime of those customers. And if you know, uh, if, you're, if you're into finance and you understand LTV, LTV is a profit-based metric, meaning this $1,600, if you're able to extend those customers, drops to the bottom line. If it doesn't, we're all forced with finding ways to go capture and acquire new subscribers, and that is a very costly thing. So really, it's not just the cost of acquiring a new customer, but it's the opportunity cost, the $1,600 of keeping the customer. The goal today is now in our industry, is really, let's keep our customers happy. So <clears throat> that move towards single play means that increased churn. That's the thing we're all fighting. And if you look on the left, that's the general portfolio mix in our industry now today, where single play is the predominant product of choice by customers. And on the right-hand side there in that bar chart, this is, these are the stats that scare me, is that single play uh, churn rates are above 26%, whereas triple play churn rates are about 10 to 12%. And that's really the biggest dynamic of change for us as an industry is that unless we figure out ways to keep that customer happy, we're gonna be forced with a continuous churn rate of our single play customers, because it doesn't look like that's slowing down anytime soon. And we saw with COVID, um, the coronavirus, an acceleration. And, and what that acceleration really means is a strain on the network. There are more people working from home today than ever before. And it's, it's my belief that where we used to go into the office five days a week and maybe once every couple of weeks we'd work from home, it's going to flip. More people will work from home and going to the office will be that unique thing that you do once a week or once every couple of weeks. So on Plume's network across our 24 million households, we actually saw about a 200% increase in weekday computer usage inside the home. We saw about 150% increase in smartphone usage and about 120% increase in other uh, device usage. What that really means is a strain on the wireless network. That strain on the wireless network oftentimes leads to issues, customer service calls. So how can we actually lean into this, these changing market forces and revitalize our business? Well, this is sort of how we think about it. We believe that the broadband product has an opportunity for all CSPs to really start building a bundle of smart home services around the broadband product. And for those smart home services, things like cybersecurity, parental controls, motionless, or excuse me, sensorless uh, motion detection, all to become part of the new fabric of the broadband product. Where the old product was very functional and complicated and there wasn't much personalization, and to Robin's point, very hardware centric. I mean, if you remember, we used to think that the more antennas a device had on it, the better the connectivity was. But then if you had to do anything from a UX perspective, like change your password, first you had to go figure out where you go to do that. And so you went to one dot, one dot something on the web. And once you got there, you saw a screen and you were completely confused on what to do. Well, today the consumer has a different option and that's to have much more power in their hands with the platform of smart home services for it to be interactive. They can make changes to their network. They can put content filtering on for their children. They can, you can prioritize video. You can do all these sorts of things. It's much more bespoke. And bespoke is really important because every home is different. Those six billion devices that Robin mentioned, they're all gonna be spread across this world very differently. And so if you have a Peloton in your, in your bedroom and you have two Nest thermostats on the outside of your house, and somebody across the home is on a FaceTime call, that requires very different connectivity and backhaul of those packets to ensure the best quality of service. And every home and every business is going to be different. And therefore, you need a software-defined network with an ability to optimize for each individual home to provide this service. It's our belief that in two or three years from now, all of those services that have really become the fabric of the broadband product is the only thing that customer, the customers will expect those. Those will be table stakes. And no one will buy those old video products of old, or excuse me, a broadband products of old. It's just like in video. Today, we wouldn't buy a video product that didn't have dynamic search, DVR, 
recommendations, poster art, and a beautiful guide to help us get through to our, get to our content quickly. All of those services became the fabric of the video product, just as all of these services are becoming the fabric of the broadband product. So with all of these services, it helps secure that subscriber, exceed their new expectations, and constantly improve. And to do that, again, a software-defined network that is not hardware-centric allows you to do so. And what that really means is that all of the smarts are happening in the cloud. So the ability to make changes and do th and offer new services is literally just the flip of the switch. It's a new algorithm in the cloud versus having to develop new agents and, and, and get uh, on, on a particular device and worry about whether or not that device has the capacity or processing power to handle these new services. That is no longer a thing. Plume has separated software from hardware to again, future-proof uh, the smart home. Now, what's interesting is it relates specifically to churn is that there is no silver bullet. There's absolutely no silver bullet. And the way that Plume thinks about the world and how we solve problems is the same way the operator does. We wake up every morning thinking like an operator, a service provider. And the first thing we do is we think about the typical corporate goals inside of a service provider. There's always the growth factor. We need to generate more revenue. We need to focus on NPS and we need to be more profitable. And typically the CEO comes out and says, these are the goals for the company for the next year. Now the question is, how do you actually impact those things? And if you can impact those things, you can likely impact churn. But again, there's no silver bullet. So we take a look at the business or functional areas associated with each of those corporate goals. And then we focus on these things called metrics of monetization. And the metrics of monetizations are the things that we think about that if taken together can actually improve and reduce churn. So for instance, from a growth perspective, we all want to get net new subscribers. So we're all thinking about how to do that. Today, Plume does it with this path to market called HomePass. That new service helps justify increases in rates. It attracts new subscribers. That's the first step. Then the second step about generating additional revenue is can we look at one metric of monetization called upsell, which is typically focused on by the product and marketing organization to get that consumer more services. Remember that more services means less likely to churn. So for instance, if we saw inside, and we see this in the Plume platform all the time, is if we saw throughput issues starting to take place across a large number of customers that have 75 megabits speed, um, uh, <clears throat> if we saw that there was throughput issues there, that is an optimal time to take a look at the second order factors that are causing those throughput issues. So the Plume system actually does this and looks and says, you know what, there are a lot of video conference calls happening on these within these homes. There's a lot of G Suite happening within these homes. Oh, it's pretty intuitive to say there's a lot more people working from home. But what's really interesting is the Plume system using machine learning can actually take a look at those homes and send an automated email campaign directly to those people, very tailored. For instance, working from home question mark, tired of frozen faces on Zoom question mark, upgrade your speed now from 75 megabits to 150 megabits for an additional 15 dollars, euros or pounds per month. Click here. That's how you use data to impact that metric of monetization. And again, the more services, the happier people are, the less likely they are to churn. From an MPS perspective, we focus on truck rolls and call-in rates. We have a suite called Haystack, which are literally machines working in the background, looking every single second of the day at the optimization of a home or a business to say, is this home healthy? Is this home healthy? And how do I ensure that this particular home is optimized in such a way that they will prevent Wi-Fi or internet related calls? So the Haystack suite of services does this. Finally, the profitability metric. Plume has built a very friendly user experience. And for those folks who want to um, go forward with self installations, and a lot of our customers do, you can think about how easy it is for you not to roll a truck, but to ra rather to allow the customer to go self install these. If you still roll a truck, you can install the Plume service at a much faster pace. 
This is along with our, our home pass suite. So focusing on all of these metrics of monetization taken together really allow for a better experience and ultimately a reduction in churn. So uh, another thing that you'll see, I think we made an announcement uh, about a week ago, Robin had mentioned Wi-Fi 6. Um, we have a Wi-Fi 6 product. Uh, we have a lot of folks currently testing that product, uh, but you, a lot that is going to be um, generally available to our, our customer base uh, within the next month. So that's going to provide uh, you know additional upgrades for your offering across the board that will help with the speeds. It provides more data. There will be new services associated with this. So you'll see a lot more coming out from Plume here in the coming months. Um, this is all run on our customer our consumer experience management platform. Um, what you'll notice here on this uh, on this slide are these two bubbles, these front-facing bubbles in white. These are what we call our paths to market for our customers. These are the things that your end user has in their hands and that allows them to manage and control their network um, in a very bespoke way. So we have home pass for the residential side of the business. Um, you can see underneath there, there are a bunch of modules or, or applications, if you will that make up that suite of services. And then on the right, if you think about the small business, there are a lot of parallels. If you take it, I'll give you one example. Parental controls in the home is very similar to employee controls inside of a business. Are there certain devices that your employees, you want them to connect to? Maybe the Sono system, but maybe not the accounting system. There are certain controls and access controls and things of that nature that are very similar in parallel. And so all of those services can run on the exact same platform with the exact same backend tools. So there is no need for a swivel chair approach or for you to change your messaging. You can ultimately go both to uh, residential and small business with a very concise message about not only improving the connectivity and quality of experience, but adding services to their, ser their solution that ultimately helps them drive uh, happiness either in the home or more efficiency in the business. On the back in there, Haystack and Harvest, these are what we call our workflow automation tools. The service, these are the things that the service provider engages with. Haystack is really about operational improvements, where Harvest is really about generating net new customers, upsell, all those things that we had talked about. And again, this is all served from the Plume Cloud. Um, so it's a nice, efficient platform. Uh, some of our success stories. Everyone always likes to talk about financial success stories, but I always get asked the question, what are the systems actually doing to improve the quality of experience? So for our ADAPT product, which is related to connectivity, uh, we look at interference, steering, and coverage as three key components of a good quality of experience. And at any given moment, there are about 60 some odd percent uh, of homes on, starting on the left here, that has some form of inter significant interference uh, happening inside those homes. The, our machines are optimizing the homes over 800 times per month. And this is across our existing base of uh, 24 million homes. So as it grows, more optimizations will take place. Um, so we do a pretty good job there of, of reducing interference by about uh, 72% there. Um, but it's really by optimizing hundreds of millions of times. That's what our machines are doing. As it relates to steering devices around the network, either to different access points, to different bands or channels, we do that 15.3 billion times per month across our network. And our system is determining that there is a need for this. So if, again, if, if, if you're asking, you know, if people ask us, well, what are the machines really doing? This is what they're doing and the benefits are there. 72% reduction in interference, a throughput increase of 275 megabits. From a coverage perspective, uh, we are measuring every single location on the Plume network 1.9 billion times per day to ensure that there aren't coverage issues. If there are coverage issues, this is an opportunity for you as a service provider to proactively reach out and help solve those problems. It, you get notified inside of our backend tools that these issues are taking place. So as it relates to churn, it's not only providing more services, but a better customer experience. And as you can see here, our machines are doing the work proactively to ensure a better customer experience. 
So these are some of the, the technical benefits. From a business uh, perspective, these are some of the stats. Uh, our customers on average are, um, they're increasing ARPU up to about 15, uh, $15 uh, US dollars per month. Um, they're seeing, our customers are seeing a 200% ROI on our service. And I think the one I'm really proud of is uh, an increase in NPS of about 60 points when Plume is inside those homes. We're also deploying new services. So your ability to offer new services and generate more revenue quicker uh, is something we're also very proud of. And we constantly serve new features and functions and services to our customers. And by the way, we don't charge more money for those things. Those things get added into our customers' uh, service plans and, and they don't have to worry about uh, being nickel and dime for those services. On the bottom side here, affecting the, uh, the expense side of the ledger, about 80% of a, uh, we, what you found is that about 80% of any service provider's broadband base calls in every year with their Wi-Fi or internet related issue. We deflect 51% of those calls. Of those calls that come in, 19% turn into truck rolls. We ground two thirds of those trucks. And for those folks who like self, who are, are willing to go with self installation, that's about $150 savings. You don't have to roll that truck and a lot of folks took advantage of that during the pandemic. Um, and now that's just the norm for them, for a lot of our customers. Finally is the churn number. This is a real churn number. We canvas every single cohort that, uh, of customers that comes on our network. And this 30% churn number, we actually looked at a sample size of 10.1 million homes, uh, where Plume was inside those homes versus a, a sample of 10.1 million homes where Plume was not in there. And we took a look at the churn rates. And we can comfortably say that when Plume is inside of a home, the, the customer is 30% less likely to churn. So we feel really comfortable about what we're doing by adding new services, by providing a better quality of experience and empowering with those backend tools, your customer service organizations to have intelligence calls or to proactively manage those customers before they actually call in because you know exactly um, you're starting to get indicators that they may be um, in, in some sort of um, in, you know, non-preferred state. Um, finally, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over. Um, White Fiber is a great customer of ours. They're doing some very unique things, very innovative. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to, to John, who's gonna speak to how he's been uh, enjoying the Plume product. Thank you very much there, Tyson. Um, I'm gonna uh, put some questions to John. I see that some of you have already sent in your questions, uh, and do keep them coming. Uh, send us some more, uh, and I'll try and get uh, as many as I can to our audience, uh, to our panelists. Um, if we can't get to every question, we'll obviously pass them to our speakers afterwards, and they can respond to you offline one to one. So, as I say, uh, first I've got a few questions I'd like to put to you, John, if I may. Uh, you've been waiting patiently while uh, we've gone through the presentations, and. I, it's really interesting to know what your experience uh, has been at White Fiber. Could, could you, first of all, start by telling us what is your role at White Fiber and how does tackling churn fit into your day-to-day? John, I'm not hearing you. Uh, I wonder if you could unmute. John, are you able to unmute? No. Uh, you could try typing M. Yeah, if you can press M on your keyboard, is that not doing it? Okay. 
While we're um, talking, uh, waiting to see if John can uh, manage that, I think he's logged out and is logging in again. Um, Tyson, perhaps I can come to you first, if I may. The question I wanted to uh, start with was, uh, and I will ask John this too, but from your experience, is it possible to identify any specific types of customer who you think are more likely to churn uh, before they do so? Yeah, it's a good, great question. So the answer is absolutely yes. They, what's interesting is they exhibit patterns. Um, not only do they, not, not only does the customer exhibit patterns, but their networks exhibit patterns. Um, and we tend to focus on um, really the, the the patterns of the network itself and how that impacts how it will likely lead to churn. So in our back end tools, we actually have a scoring mechanism. Um, that scores the network from zero to 100. And we take a look at a number of factors, some very technical like fire rates, some non-technical things like how many devices are in the home. And so we take a look at all those things. We provide a scoring mechanism so that any customer service rep can go in when they're having a conversation or even prior to a conversation, take a look at the, the, the home network to see if this is a potential th uh, churn threat. Beyond that, what our system does is it actually provides a list, a prioritized list of all of the customers that have the lowest scores. So you as a service provider can actually look at that list and proactively use our tools for remote management to try and solve those problems or reach out to the customer proactively to help solve those problems. Um, so that, a lot of it has to do with the really network. Yep. That's really helpful. I, I can imagine that being a, a, a tool of daily use. John, um, good to see you there. Can I ask you, uh, could you describe your role at White Fiber, and in particular, how does tackling churn fit into your day-to-day? -day? Um, I'm the CEO at White Fiber. We're a small operator on the Isle of Wight, which is a, an island off the south coast of uh, England, for those of you uh, who don't know. Um, I mean, we are, um, I guess, a slightly unusual case study uh, in the sense that by virtue of operating on an island, uh, we, we have a limited geography um, and that allows us to provide a, a particularly exceptional level of customer service. So uh, churn, our churn levels are actually pretty low, uh, less than 8%. Um, they've gone up a little recently. The, the UK regulator has taken some action uh, requiring all operators to write to customers at the end of their contract. So that's created a little bit extra churn, but not too much. Um, but nevertheless, we are a small operator competing with the, the biggest of operators. Um, and being able to provide that full uh, suite of services. So we talked earlier about bundles and the decline of bundles. Um, so you know we we wear a uh, we wear a cable company uh, now upgrading to full fiber. So our, we're pretty much down to our last uh, thousand uh, HFC customers. Everyone else on full fiber. It's and we wear we provided TV, we provided broadband, we provided phone lines, um, TV probably more than any other uh, bundle service now is is available uh, standalone over the top. It didn't used to be. Um, and what it actually done is has heightened the requirement for for good broadband. Um, and, and I guess an overarching point, you know, I would make uh, pertinent to this discussion is, so we've been talking here um, about Wi-Fi a lot. You know, I'm a broadband provider when our customers call in nine times out of ten they don't say i've got a problem with my broadband they say i've got a problem with my wi-fi or they say my wi-fi is broken uh, when they mean their broadband is broken so the the, the consumer doesn't differentiate uh you know in, in terminology so you can we were at the point where we were delivering this you know brand new gigabit full fiber broadband into the home. Um, but the customer wasn't seeing it because the Wi-Fi coverage around the home didn't match the superior service that was coming into the home. So
So Plume helped us um, solve that problem and then a lot, lot more. Are there any other ways that you could sort of zero in on that you, uh, enable you to strengthen your customer relationships and increase subscriber satisfaction? And also, uh, perhaps you could uh, react to the point that I was putting to Tyson a moment ago, which uh, was concerning the uh, ways uh, of uh, identifying any specific types of customer who are more likely to churn. Um. I mean, in terms of strengthening our relationship, uh, I mean, we, uh, you can see our, our logo there, uh, White Fiber, because we care. Uh, so we do put a huge amount of emphasis on caring about our customers, caring about um, uh, our employees, caring about our, our community uh, on the island. Um, so it is all around that. We've built a really strong local brand uh, based on on that caring ethos um, and nothing was ever too much trouble for us uh, literally I mean we have you know employees whose sole job is, is is to go out not every day not all the time um, but you know helping little old ladies you know when they press the wrong button on the remote control of their TV and they change the source on their TV and they can't figure out how to get it back. That's how far we go. And um, Plume, so that are two things really uh, in answer to both questions. So first off, Plume gives us such a great insight into the customer's home, the customer's land environment uh, to enable us to remotely diagnose just what's going on there. Because um, uh, I, I wouldn't say this if any of our customers were on here, but customers don't always tell you the truth. You know, they, they, you know, they might have cut a cable uh, accidentally, um, or got a new TV that's that's not working quite right, and you know, pretending to you that it always worked and it suddenly stopped. Plume lets us see through all of that and get to the, to to the root of the problem. Uh, but the other piece of it is, uh, and and one of our huge efforts going forward is about it, making it really easy or easier for our customers to do business with us. And increasingly, customers, they, they don't want to pick up the phone to you uh, when they've got a problem. Um, increasingly, they want to be able to chat with you, but, but even more so, they want to be able to, to fix it for themselves. Uh, yeah. and, and the Plume app actually lets them do that. So in a much more simplistic, they have a much more simplistic view of their land than, than the one we have. Um, uh, looking from the uh, from from the outside, um, but it's enough of a view to let them see for themselves that if their um, you know iPhone isn't streaming video very well, it's because it's got poor signal strength. Um, an amber coloured or a red coloured signal strength uh, connection to to Wi-Fi, and so on and so on and so on. So so all, so less you know making it easier for the customer to to actually take care of these things for themselves is, is a key part to reducing churn i'm sitting here and wishing i could move 100 miles south right now because that that service sounds amazing um tyson coming back to you um it's it's really interesting to hear how plume is using cloud connections and artificial intelligence or ai uh, and data insight to optimize the vital metrics of quality of experience, and you've given us an uh, eye-opening uh, indicator of some of those metrics. Um, is, in your view, machine learning going to play a role in developing Plume's offering in the next generation? I'm, I'm thinking as your customers learn more and more about what customers, what consumers want. Yeah, uh, good. we've been using machine learning since the founding of Plume. So we've been using that. Um, there's no way, you know, you talked, let's talk about some of the numbers. The 24 million active households today, we're growing at about a million households per month. Um, the 6 billion devices you mentioned, we actually see an average of 17 devices per home on our network. Um, yeah. <clears throat> these are all big numbers. And there is no way that you could handle that scale without using machine learning. Um, and so it's, it's not only about the scale game, but then it's about the data game. So Plume is really a data company. And if you think about 
uh, I made this comment at the beginning that um, the way we communicate, you know, Slack, you know, uh, text messages, whatever it might be, that's all delivered from the cloud. And John just mentioned uh, video over the top, that's delivered from the cloud. And I think if you think about those two major products for our industry, and if you think about who sort of took over those products, who offered, who's offering Slack or WhatsApp or Instagram or whatever it is to communicate, and who's offering YouTube Red and Prime and all this stuff, it's the cloud guys. And all those, th those companies, Google, Facebook, Netflix, they all grow, grew up in the cloud. We, in our industry, really didn't grow up in the cloud. So what's really important is that you can use these things like machine learning to drive new services. But what's, what's important to understand from an operator perspective is that to win going forward means that you have to embrace the cloud service and you've got to find the right partners to help drive new services from the cloud. So all of our services from day one have, we've used machine learning and AI. Um, they happen every single day to, again, find these needles in a haystack, if you will. Um, that's why our backend systems are called haystack. Um, but the cloud pieces, I can't, it, like, it, I, I, I want to emphasize it over and over again because that's not where we grew up in our industry. And that's not a knock against our industry. Our industry is fantastic. We deliver phenomenal service to the door. It's when you start to get inside, it's no longer a last mile game. It's a game of last few millimeters. And that's where you have to use uh, machine learning. All of our uh, optimization algorithms run on machine learning. Otherwise, we couldn't scale to do it, but it's all happening from the cloud. So Plume has come in to be essentially a big part of the R&D acceleration and effort for the industry because we did grow up in the cloud. Our headquarters is in Palo Alto, California. And so for the service provider, thinking about offering these new, this new suite of digital smart home services, not thermostats and stuff, but digital smart home services to their consumer around the broadband network itself, I think is really critical and important to, to, to point out. Thank you, Tyson. John, a question for you. Do some particular customer types fit into the smart home services model better than others? I mean, perhaps those that are already asking for solutions like whole home Wi-Fi and cyber security or higher data users maybe? Um, I think clearly uh, those who can afford to pay more are going to uh, 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 adopt these additional services sooner. The, the reality is though every single customer wants uh, broadband that just works, Wi-Fi that just works. Uh, irrespective of whether they're connecting one device uh, to it uh, or um, 17 devices, as Tyson just said, I just looked whilst we were talking, 13.2 is our average number of devices um, uh, in, in each home. Um, so, so for me, um, yes, the people with larger homes, um, people who are, who are more well off will be the early adopters. Uh, but in fact, um, you know, perhaps uniquely in the in, in in the Plume customer base, we ship Plume to every single one of our customers. So every customer benefits from Plume. They don't necessarily benefit from multiple Plume pods to spread Wi-Fi throughout the home, but they get uh, you know, all of the basic benefits of Plume uh, around the, the Plume Home Pass uh, set of features. You know, home security, uh, to name but one, uh, parental controls, and mm. and so on. So, I, I think every customer needs it. Whether every customer will pay for it or not uh, is another thing. Uh, but yeah. you know, the business case for us wasn't only about uh, customers paying for it, and and uh, it was about the, the the metrics that Tyson mentioned earlier: uh, reduced truck roll, uh, improved. Um, customer service, you know, our NPS has always been pretty high. It's always been in the low 50s, uh, but actually we've seen it rise uh, another 10 points over the last six months. We're into the 60s now, uh, and that's a really, really high NPS 
uh, for uh, for a telecom company for an operator by any standard. Yeah, that's very high. Um, Tyson, one of our delegates is asking, uh, will smart Wi-Fi be able to segment and prioritize different networks and traffic types in the home? Uh, would you like to say something to that? Yeah, sure. So we, we already do it. Um, so there are certain, so the answer is yes, we're a software defined network, so we can prioritize any type of traffic. Um, we already do it a little bit naturally. Um, for things like video, whether it's video content that somebody's watching or video cameras that you have on the outside of your house. Well, we do already prioritize some traffic. Um, but what's really unique is that, again, we can, we can prioritize any traffic. So we have a lot of customers outside of cable and telco um, that are talking and prospects that are talking to us. Think of large Fortune 100 companies who now have thousands of people working from home and want to be able to bifurcate the network between that stuff in which you do professionally and recreationally simultaneously right and there what ultimately people want to prioritize during the workday are zoom citrix microsoft team meetings g suite those sorts of things and so yes absolutely uh, given that we're the software defined network we can do those things um, so you'll likely see plume um, expand a little bit outside of um, the, the cable and telco vertical as that becomes more and more important, or us arming up folks like White Fiber to go ahead and provide that as a service to folks who have large groups of employees working um, in a particular region or location. Yeah, I, I've got one eye on the clock, and we've still got a little bit of time, so I'm going to um, ask John this. Uh, John, if you could uh, share a little bit of, about what last year has been like, uh, it would be really interesting. How is White Fiber in a difficult time moving forward and still raising the bar in terms of services and product lineup? And has the pandemic brought any evident permanent changes that are going to influence your business? Uh, the, the pandemic clearly created uh, a wealth of operational difficulties for us. So uh, as a business, uh, every employee is, is working from home uh, as we speak, uh, except for our, our field engineers who are um, uh, going into people's homes and uh, installing new connections or, or, or improving existing connections. So uh, I think uh, as, a, as a business, um, that shift to home working actually has been really really good you know our you know answer rate on telephone calls uh has improved um our, our, our the whole feel of the whole efficiency of the business uh productivity of the business uh, has improved have we seen uh changes to, to customer behavior obviously it has heightened the the customer's awareness the market's awareness of the the need for good broadband and, and what constitutes good broadband. Uh, and so, yes, we, 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 we've done really well. Uh, we had a great year in terms of customer acquisition. Um, you know, um, I think in part uh, prompted by uh, the need for better broadband as, as everyone was stuck at home with families homeschooling and, and little to entertain them other than streaming video. Uh, are those changes uh, permanent? I think the understanding of what good broadband is, I think. Um, home workers uh, and in particular businesses being prepared to pay for an upgraded home broadband service for their employees work from, working from home. Uh, we've not seen uh, any of that. It's all been on the employee to sort their own uh, home broadband. Um, uh, but I think I think the greatest takeaway from the pandemic is going to be more home workers uh, and more home and, and a greater recognition by people at home of the the need for good broadband. Really interesting. Um, I'm going to ask the same thing to you, Tyson. Um, how briefly, if you would, in a minute or so, can you give me an idea? Of, uh, how you think that the pandemic has changed the nature of the service that you're providing and that your uh, customers are asking for? Yeah, um, 
the customer's expectations have just increased dramatically. Um, and it's because they have critical functions taking place inside their home. Um, again, all this stuff that John just talked about, about work from home, those are critical functions. And that's very important to people to be productive and to have an opportunity to be productive. Without good connectivity inside the home, you can't be as productive. Um, the other thing that we've seen is that it's not only about work, but you're now playing more from home. Um, in fact, at least here in the United States, the fastest growing um, part of our economy is home remodeling. And it's because people are no longer going on vacations and stuff, they're remodeling their homes, which means they're staying put in their homes. And one of the uh, low lights of our economy are people going to movies. They don't go to movies anymore. Uh, people are staying at home. And so I think that's gonna continue to be a thing where people are entertaining more from their homes. Their home is really their safe place. And that's gonna continue for at least the next decade. Um, people aren't going to change that. This pandemic has really changed the way that we live our lives. So that means their expectations and the quality of experience, not only professionally, but recreationally inside their homes has really shined a light on what service providers are providing. And we're just happy that we can be there to help continue to deliver on the promise of the best service inside those homes and people like white fiber. I mean, that's, that's really what we're pleased with. It, it's so encouraging at a time like this to hear such a positive um, outcome for both companies. Thank you, uh, everyone. Uh, we are out of time. The aim of this webinar, as you see, has been to learn how to leverage cloud and big data to beat churn. And we've heard about optimizing quality of experience, about improving cybersecurity and increasing subscriber satisfaction. Sadly, we have to go. Uh, please don't forget to keep an eye on our website at vanillaplus.com and there in the next 24 hours you'll find this webinar available to stream from the site. And don't forget to bookmark it for the latest news, interviews, blogs and videos. It really just remains for me to say a huge thank you to our speakers, Robin Duke Woolley of Beecham Research. Thank you, Robin. Thanks, everyone. Sorry, and I was on Tyson mute. Yes, Mar th thanks very much. <laughs> That's okay. Tyson Marion of Plume. Thanks, Tyson. Thank you. And of course, John Irvine of White Fiber. It's been really uh, great to hear your perspective on this, John. You're welcome. Most of all, ladies and gentlemen, we want to thank you for joining us. Keep safe, and we really do appreciate the time you spent with us. From all of us here at Vanilla Plus, enjoy the rest of your day. Bye for now.